Welcome to the Filipino seminar. Uh, today, uh, our first speaker is Rafael Alvarez Garcia from uh, Harvard University, talking about the distance conjecture in F theory via semi stable degenerations. Please. Okay. Thank you, Nicole, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I will be reporting on a series of works carried out together with Song Yu and with Timo. But before I do so, let me give you a brief introduction and motivation to the topic. The distance conjecture, which is surely familiar to, to this audience, states that as we traverse an infinite distance in moduli space, an infinite tower of states becomes asymptotically massless, thereby breaking the effective description of the theory. And in view of this conjecture, there are two natural questions that we can ask. First, what is the nature of the states that become light? And second, what kind of theories do we encounter at infinite distance? For the first question, we could answer Kaluza-Klein states or tensionless strings, but perhaps also something else. While for the second one, it, would, it could be conceivable to think that we might get a qualitatively different theory of quantum gravity at infinite distance, or we may instead recover something that we already know. The emergent string conjecture is a refinement of the SDC that claims that it's Kaluza-Klein states and tensionless strings that we obtain at infinite distance, and that we always recover a theory that we already know. To be precise, the statement that was put forward by Sun Yu, Wolfgang, and Timo in 2019 is that infinite distance limits are either pure decompactification limits, in which the infinite tower of states is given by Kaluza-Klein replicas, or emergent string limits, in which it's given by the excitations of an asymptotically tensionless string. And emergent string limits are really a transition to a duality frame that is determined by a unique, emergent, critical and weakly coupled string, and the adjectives are here important to really characterize what these limits are. This conjecture has been subject to scrutiny in various corners of the modulate space, and perhaps let me just highlight this last paper in which we check that emergent membrane limits are actually not but today we want to focus instead on the complex structure modulate space of F theory. And this is a topic that was already analyzed for eight dimensional models in this couple of papers from 2021. Today, we want to focus instead in the geometrically richer six dimensional scenario. And since we are concerning ourselves with F theory, let me give you a brief reminder. This is a framework for studying the geometric regime of string theory while also incorporating non perturbative effects in the string coupling. And the theory is really defined for compactifications on genus one uh, vibrations, where the complex structure of the elliptic fiber gives you the type to be axiodeleton, while the base of the vibration gives you the physical space depth. If the vibration has a section, we can encode its information in a so-called Weierstrass model, which is a hypersurface equation like the one shown in here in a suitable ambient space. And this gives you a vibration over B by virtue of FNG being sections of appropriate line bundles on the base. Importantly, F theory gives us a dictionary between geometry and physics. And an important part of this correspondence is that between singularities in codimension one in the base and gauge algebras associated with seven brains in space time. Luckily, Kodaira and Neron have classified the types of singular fibers that we can have. And you just need to take the defined polynomials F and G and check their orders of vanishing over this codimension one loci in space time. And this will tell you the kind of algebra that you can have. But you see that this table only goes up to E8, which corresponds to 4, 5, 10. And beyond that, we have so-called non-minimal elliptic fibers. And these are special because they don't allow for a crepant resolution in the fiber. And, and for this reason, they are typically discarded. However, these are the type of elliptic fibers we're interested in because they are the ones that are at infinite distance in the open modulate space of string theory. So to recapitulate the motivations for the work, which are twofold, in view of the emergent string conjecture, it is natural to ask does it hold in the complex structure modulate space of F theory? And this was answered affirmatively for eight dimensional models. Today, we focus instead on six dimensional models. This could be a strong motivation for it. But also, purely from the F theory point of view, we may ask what is the meaning of non minimal singularities in F theory? These singularities don't allow for a crepant resolution in the fiber and are, for this reason, typically discarded. However, they correspond to the open moduli. E infinite distance limits that we are interested in studying. Hence, to give a one-line summary, we are interested in understanding both the geometry and the physics of infinite distance and minimal singularities of elliptic Calabi-Yau fields. Before I go into the body of the talk, let me give you a condensed summary of the results. We are dealing with the generations of elliptic Calabi-Yau trefolds 
that are asymptoting to a central fiber that represents the endpoint of the limit. And we observe that space time degenerates at the endpoint of the limit into various components. And these various components will be some of them at local weak coupling and some of them at local strong coupling. Moreover, because the base is degenerating into various components, seven brains behave a bit differently from how they do usually. Namely, seven brains can now extend and produce local enhancements in some components that will, however, not translate into global enhancements for the model as a whole. Finally, the limits are interpreted then as emergent string limits or as partial decompactification limits, but the decompactification limits are to theories that contain defects breaking higher dimensional Lorentz invariants, hence not just to the vacuum of the theory. And the study is structured into two main parts. In part one, that is already on the archive, we perform a systematic mathematical analysis of the problem, while in part two, that will soon come to the archive, we extract the asymptotic physics of these models. In part one, what we employ is the theory of semi-stable degenerations to completely characterize the base geometry of these asymptotic uh, theories. Not only that, but we also tell you the kind of line bundles that you can um, define over the components, which is of course uh, crucial for NF theory interpretation. And this leads to the conclusion that the components of this asymptotic space-time are local Calabi-Yau spaces that are, however, glued consistently to, to form as a whole a Calabi-Yau internal space. Regarding the seven brain content, we also define a physical discriminant from which you can read the seven brain content of the global model. Coming now to the physics, as mentioned earlier, some of the limits will be the compactification limits. And in this decompactification process, some of the gauge algebras will suffer enhancements that will allow us to reinterpret them as higher dimensional gauge algebras. But this will not be the case for every single gauge algebra in the theory. Some of them will not enhance in the limit. And these algebras will remain as localized defect algebras in six dimensions. Also, and in relation with emergent string limits, we compute restrictions on the existence or sometimes non-existence of global weak coupling limits of these geometries. Finally, whenever possible, we draw connections to the heterotic duals to have yet another point of view on the asymptotic physics. Let me now start with part one which is concerned with the log Calabi-Yau resolutions of these spaces. The infinite distance limits that we want to study are um, described in, term, in algebraic geometry in terms of a so-called degeneration that for us today will be a family of elliptic Calabi-Yau threefolds in which we single out a particular fiber of the family, the central fiber that will stand for the endpoint of the infinite distance limit. And to see how this looks explicitly, I told you before that I can describe my F-theory models in six dimensions by some Bayashtas model. I simply allow the, uh, the defining polynomials F and G uh, to depend on a further coordinate, which is the coordinate on an open disk, open complex uh, disk. And this stands for an open patch in the moduli space. As I vary U, F and G vary, and hence the F-theory model is deformed. But I don't want just any degeneration. I want one that is bringing us to infinite distance. Hence, I need to allow for some curves to develop non-minimal singularities as we approach the central fiber. And an important fact of this part one is that the geometrical representative of the endpoint of the limit is actually not unique. There can be very, uh, various equivalent uh, representatives. And in part one, we make an effort to present this uh, endpoint of the limit in a way that is suitable to extract the physics in part two. And this presentation that is convenient to us is that of a so-called semi-stable degeneration in which the family variety is smooth and the central fiber is reduced with components that are crossing normally. So this is the cartoon that I showed before and we have such a degeneration here. Luckily, we are assured that we can always do it because we have the semi-stable reduction theorem, but this theorem from the mathematics literature is actually an existence proof. And hence, beyond part one and part two, we will also put a third part of the work and note in which we'll we will give a constructive proof of the chain of birational transformations necessary to put at least a subclass of the degenerations into this semi-stable form explicitly. Let us now look at how the resolutions of this, um, how the semi-stable degenerations look uh, in our setup. In the paper, we're more general, but for the talk today, I will focus on a subclass known as single infinite distance limits 
that we define in the paper. And the definition is a bit more subtle, but for today, we can regard them as the ones in which the non-minimal curves are non-intersecting. So I have a family of elliptical labial trifolds, and this family is degenerate into a central element whose space I'm depicting here. And in a usual degeneration, this would be at finite distance, I will have a calabi yao uh, internal space when I reach the endpoint of the limit. But we want to be at infinite distance, hence we need to allow for some curves to be non-minimal. And we prove in the paper that these curves must be of genus zero or genus one. And genus one is really an edge case. It almost never happens. And so in the paper for the systematic study, we focus on genus zero degenerations. To remove the non-minimal singularities, we perform a series of base blow-offs. And because these base blow-offs, they are non crepant uh, resolution procedures, we need to also perform a series of line bundle shifts in order to preserve the calabi condition space. For a single infinite distance limit, this leads to an open chain resolution like the one I'm depicting here on screen. And each of these components is not a calabi space. It's actually a lock calabi space. But they are glued together in such a way that the collection of them taken as a whole is a calabi internal space. For single infinite distance limits, the exceptional components are actually Hilsopov surfaces whose type can be determined from the self-intersection of the curves that are blown up in order to produce them. This much for the geometry of the resolved base. Let me now say some words about the seven brains. In a standard F theory model in six dimensions, the base will be an irreducible surface and the seven brains will be represented by irreducible curves. And such irreducible curves will either intersect over points or completely overlap. But once you have a reducible surface as the base, uh, more exotic things can happen. For example, in this local component, we may have a local enhancement, but however, when you take the global point of view, you see it's actually two different seven brains that are, that are coming together and enhancing just in this component, but not um, producing a global enhancement. Sort of the opposite situation would be one in which in one component, you would observe in principle naively two gauge algebras, like for example, for this yellow brain in here, but when you take the global point of view, you see that these two lines are actually patching up into a single irreducible curve in the end component and hence should be regarded as a single gauge factor. And in the paper, we define a physical discriminant from which you can unambiguously read these features. I will not go into more details on part one. I would direct you to the paper for the details or just um, uh, ask me later at the end of the talk. Let us now move instead to the asymptotic physics, which is part two. And for part two, we focus on a subclass of the generations, namely those of Hertzbuch models, to which we can apply the machinery that was developed in part one. And doing so, we can completely characterize them, the result being printed here on screen. There are four different types of the generations of Hertzbuch models, and we give you the types of curves that can support the non-minimal fibers, the types of open chain resolutions that they lead to, and the line bundles and discriminant components that you obtain in these models. For the remainder of the talk, we will focus on horizontal models, which are the ones highlighted in blue, because they have two convenient features. First, they are relative versions of the AD models that were already studied in 2021, and hence we can leverage some of this knowledge to extract information about the physics of these models. And also, some of them have controlled heterotic duals, which gives us yet another point of view on the problem. You don't need to recall the AD story in detail, but maybe let me just mention that infinite distance, the generations of elliptic K-free surfaces can be mathematically split into two types, type two and type three. But for physics reasons, it's convenient to actually subclassify them into type two A, type two B, type three A, and type three B, where the B types are global weak coupling, which you can observe because the generic elliptic fiber in all components is singular of collider type um, 1N while the A types are at least in one component at local strong coupling, which you can see because they are smooth in dimension zero. I will later review type 2A in some detail, but for now, just recall that there are four types. And because the horizontal models that we're interested in are just relative versions of these AD models, it seems reasonable to subclassify them by inheriting the classification of the AD models. To do so, take uh, choose a point on the base of the Hertzberg surface used to construct them, and restrict the model to such a point. This gives you a vertical slice of the horizontal model, which corresponds to a degeneration of elliptic K3 surfaces. And then you can simply classify horizontal models according to the Kulikov type of their generic 
uh, vertical slides. The classification in this one that just mimics the one on the previous slide. Some of them will be at global weak coupling, and this cannot occur for just any Hilsebuch surface used in the construction of the model. And we understand when this can happen and when and not, but I will not have time to go into this. So if you're interested, you can ask me at the end of the talk. The generic fibers in all components are smooth, which means all components are at local strong coupling. And if there are any intermediate components, these components can actually be blown down because they only offer redundant information. And in this way, we can achieve a two-component presentation like the one shown here. The two end components are rationalistic surfaces, each of them with 12 brains. And so you can regard that has been split into halves with the 24 brains distributed uh, equally between the two parts. This is surely familiar to many of you because this is just a stable degeneration limit that has already been featured in the F3 literature since the inception of the theory. But we can interpret it from the point of view of the asymptotic physics. Let's take this one chain uh, present here in the base. And you can see that because of the position uh, of the presence of the seven brains, this one chain cannot be slipped off into triviality. And hence, you can fiber the one cycles uh, present in the elliptic fiber over sigma to produce some non-trivial two cycles that are actually degenerated in the limit. By wrapping M2 brains on this ring in two cycles, you get two towers of asymptotically massless DPS particles that can then be dually interpreted as kaluza klein towers. And this runs you a decompactification from eight dimensions to 10 dimensions. But not only that, because if you take the towers together with the 12 of 12, uh, two sets of 12, uh, seven brains, you find in eight dimensions, a double loop enhanced algebra that can be then reinterpreted in the higher dimensional theory as E8 cross E8. And this type of algebra was actually to be expected because these models are dual to the HE stream compactified on T2 going to large volume. In six dimensions, things are a bit more complicated because brains are not just points, they are curves, and they can come in different flavors. First, you may have horizontal brains, which are completely localized in one of the base components, like the purple uh, line here or the uh, blue line here. And these are the analogs of the 87 brains. You may also have vertical brains, like the red one, which are completely contained in the fiber over uh, points, single points in the base of the head spot. And finally, you can have, and, and these vertical brains, uh, let me add, have no analog in the AD situation. And finally, you can have mixed brains, which are a recombination of the previous two types. Let us then move to the six dimensional horizontal type 2A models, which by definition are the ones in which the generic slice is the Kulikov type 2A model. And I'm depicting such a generic vertical slice, for example, here or here and here. And you can observe that from one generic vertical slice to another, the only thing that changes is the position of the eight dimensional seven brains, which are obtained by restriction of the six dimensional horizontal brains. But the position of the seven brains in an AD model um, within a component does not affect the asymptotic physics. And hence, they all lead to a consistent asymptotic picture. And because I can, I can take my six dimensional model and cover it by vertical slices, generic vertical slices, almost everywhere, this gives me information about the bulk asymptotic physics. This picture, however, fails. Not all generic uh, vertical slices are generic. And on the heterotic dual side correspond to the degenerations of the heterotic K3 surface. And in this picture would be, for example, um, the location of this uh, vertical red enhancement. Because this is where the generic picture fails, it's where we expect purely six-dimensional physics to be concentrated at. The interpretation of these models is that of the compactifications from 6D to 8D that actually present defects. To see this, you is a Kulikov type 2A model, so we can locally define the them. This will give you two towers that can be in the decompactification. And if you take the towers together with the seven brains, you then obtain, obtain the bulk uh, gauge algebra in the decompactified theory. So this is information is coming from the generic vertical slices. But as mentioned, not all vertical slices are generic. and in some of them, like the red one here, we cannot define this local two cycles. And hence, the gauge algebras associated with these vertical enhancements, they will remain lower dimensional, will not enhance in the limit, 
and we'll be living in the world volume of some six dimensional defects present in the decompactified field. Okay, so the vertical gauge algebras are clearly interesting because as mentioned, they are the gauge groups that live in the decompactification defects, but also if one takes a heterotic dual perspective, they correspond to non perturbative contributions to the gauge sector. And interestingly, one cannot just tune such vertical gauge factors at will. Tune a vertical gauge uh, factor, the intersection product of the minus n curve of the Hertzberg surface with the residual discriminant becomes more and more negative. And you can use this property to give bounds on the rank of the defect gauge groups. To see how this works, imagine you start with a two component model, and then you start tuning a vertical gauge algebra. You can do that, but you will be forced by the geometry to have also a horizontal enhancement. And as you increase the uh, vertical gauge rank, you will at some point saturate the bound that we give. And at, it is at this point that the horizontal gauge algebra will become E8, which if you remember is the maximum in the Colera uh, neuron table. You can then push forward and try to violate the bound on the vertical gauge rank by uh, placing a higher tuning on the, on the green line. And you can do so, but this will force the horizontal enhancement to become non-minimal. And at this point, the model then uh, requires a new resolution process that sheds a new component of space-time. And this is how the geometry enforces the bound, because in the new component, the maximal um, gauge rank for the, so, so sorry, in the new component, the rank for the vertical uh, gauge enhancement will actually satisfy the bound that we give. And what you were able to forcefully tune in the previous step was just one of these local enhancements that I warned you uh, about before. So the residual discriminant would be coming in together, intersecting the vertical enhancement here and producing a local enhancement in the two original components that however, does not correspond to a global enhancement for the model uh, taken as a whole. In this way, we can produce some tables and the one printed in here uh, applies to horizontal type 2A models, which are the ones we're discussing now. Let me conclude by giving a heterotic dual perspective on this dual, uh, on these defect gauge algebras. Um, a further limit, I need to be in the so-called adiabatic regime to have control over the duality map, which means I need to demand this hierarchy of volumes on top of the semi-stable degeneration. Because of this overlaid limit, I'm actually compactifying from 60 to 10D, but the important feature we want to discuss now, which are the defect algebras, will still remain six-dimensional and we can hence uh, discuss them without anything fundamental change. Interestingly, heterotic K3 singularities behave much differently from how they do in the, do in the type two theories because a heterotic K3 singularity does not directly lead to non perturbative gauge algebras unless they are probed by some singular gauge bundle contributions. And on the heterotic side, we indeed have such singular gauge bundle contributions an example would be point-like instantons with trivial holonomy, which from the F-theory side uh, would be seen as what I mentioned to finite distance uh, non-minimal singularities. The picture then would be the following. On the F-theory side, we would tune a vertical enhancement that we are saying does not enhance and remains six-dimensional in the limit. K3 surface that would be probed by point-like instantons gauge algebra. But you know that non perturbative uh, sorry, that point like instantons can be traded by a small instanton transition for M5 brains moving in the horaba witten interval. And hence, at least in the adiabatic regime, the interpretation of these defect algebras is that of M5 brain stacks probing heterotic K3 singularities. Let me now summarize and conclude. From the F-theory side, we were interested in studying non-minimal singularities of the F-theory model, which is dual to studying open moduli infinite distance limits, which are interesting from the point of view of the sum. And to do so, we start by doing a systematic geometrical analysis of the setup in which we classify the possible degeneration types, but we also give you bounds on the defect gauge algebras and give you restrictions on the existence or sometimes non-existence of global weak coupling limits. The limits are then either partial decompactifications that contain defects or emergent string limits which are related to the weak coupling feature. And as an outlook, this opens up a novel approach to studying the non perturbative open moduli space, which is a corner of the moduli space that has received uh, less attention. 
and also leaves uh, some new directions to be pursued. For example, today we focused on infinite distance co-dimension one non-minimal singularities, but we might as well be interested in analyzing the co-dimension two infinite distance non-minimal singularities. The analysis could also be extended to fourfolds, and it would also be interesting to understand the relation of this approach to that of the Hodge theoretic approach initiated in this paper, which is complementary. To conclude, let me remind you that beyond part one and part two that we discussed today, we will put a further note on the archive in which we will explain how to explicitly construct the chain of birational transformations that lead you from a degeneration of Hertzberg models to their semi-stable presentation. And that was all on my part, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. On. Thank you, Alfred. Are there questions? Uh, yes, Michael, please. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, heterotic uh, relation uh, for the uh, the K three compactification. So, is there is there anything uh, that will happen with the fourfold uh, compactification um, that could be related to the heterotic case? So you mean um, which for compactification? Sorry, uh, on the, well, you the, the uh, in relation to the heterotic case, and I believe that was heterotic on K three. Right. So, so what would happen? Know. The four, fourfold would be the relation when you go down to four dimensions with uh, F theory. Is there ah. any relation to the heterotic case in that case? Well, it's a case uh, I have not looked into, so I, I don't have further insights on the four dimensional case yet. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the other question would be, since you get non-perturbative information in the heterotic case, does that give you any information about uh, supersymmetry breaking or, or condensates or anything like that in the sixth dimensional case, which would be easier to study? Right. So in the limits we are considering, supersymmetry will be partially broken because we have these uh, defects in space time. So um, I'm starting from a six dimensional theory with n equals one supersymmetry. And when I'm decompactifying, I'm preserving all of my supersymmetry breaking defects. And hence, I would expect that um, the supersymmetry would uh, remain uh, the six dimensional one unless I somehow send the defects to infinity by some further limit. So, in that sense, the supersymmetry just remains uh, the same as uh, seen in six dimensions before the large volume limit is taken. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. Uh, next question, Lara. Hi, just wanted to say a very nice talk. Um, I have sort of a, a broad question about the program in general that you guys are working on, which I think is very nice. Um, historically, you know, in, in F theory and other um, uh, types of string compactifications, we've used uh, crepent resolutions as sort of a guideline of how singular you can go. And you guys very you know nicely are showing that you can move beyond that in these cases. My question is, do you believe that there are any sort of infinite distance limits in, say, the Calabia moduli space that are too bad to be considered? Like, can you be too singular? Can it be too sick? Or do you imagine that all of the infinite distance limits should be falling under this conjecture in this program? Right. So one possibility would be that some of the infinite distance limits of the Calabia threefolds could be studied in string theory or M theory more generally, but perhaps not in F theory. So one possibility would be that a certain infinite distance limit of a Calabi L threefold could be studied geometrically and could be understood in M theory, but would at the same time obstruct taking the F theory limit on top such that we could not study it uh, within this formalism that we are considering today. I think that would be a possibility. And then, Beyond that, I guess there are some more exotic um, types of objects in F theory that one could uh, could consider and would be interesting to analyze more, like um, what happens when you stack frozen singularities or things of this sort related to O7 plus planes, for example. Gotcha. That makes sense. That's a good answer. I, I Let me ask just a slight refinement, which is I'm sort of probing questions about how bad the topology could get. So let me give an example like in type 2, not F theory, but imagine that I did type 2 on the quintic. And I chose the manifold to be, you know, x naught to the five, right? That's not even Calabi-Yau, right? That's that's a terrible singularity. 
So that's non-reduced and reducible and weird. So do you think that, you know, is there, would that be too bad to, to have, you know, distance conjecture physics apply to such a limit or? So is there any mm -hmm. sort of topological bound that you can envision is sort of where that example is coming towards? Right. So in this case, it's um, okay. That to be on the quintic, if you can express this as a degeneration, uh, of the type we study, then you could use uh, Manford's theorem to claim that there will be a chain of uh, modifications, possibly after a base change of the, the generation, that would make the presentation um, semi-stable. And then the central fiber would be, as mentioned, reduced with local normal crossings, which would be desirable. Uh, but I don't know if you would necessarily know explicitly how to get to this presentation. So I don't know how that existence proof would be how useful it would be in this particular case. But yeah, it would be interesting to, to okay. study this for a yeah. yeah, thanks. I'm taking away from that sort of open question, not clear if there is like a too bad limit, but that's that's interesting. So thank you. Thank you. Great, so thanks for your question and thanks for the talk. I think we have to move on to Adarto.